I'm going to talk about my feelings about bits versus bitless and the question that I wish we were discussing instead of bits versus bitless. What is a better question? Obviously, lots and lots and lots of people will say, whenever the topic comes up about bits, it's not the bit or it's not the tool, it's the hands that use it. That's almost technically correct and completely useless for this discussion. And I think it's not a very productive answer because in theory, that might be true, but in practice, I've almost never seen anyone at any level in more than 40 years with horses who doesn't sometimes do things that they claim they don't do or that they don't want to do, whether it's pulling backward on the rein, uh, whether it's holding at the wrong time, or especially accidentally if the horse just suddenly moves and moves his head and the rider is not right there with him. And I'll get this out of the way right up front. I don't ride with a bit. Because no matter how long I've been riding, I don't think I'm qualified to ride with a bit. I don't ride with a bit because I want to protect my horses from me. But it doesn't mean, spoiler alert, that I think it's always implicitly bad that someone uses a bit. Another thing that comes up all the time is people will say, well, I use what the horse prefers, or I use what's best for the individual horse. So many people will say, well, I use bitless for some horses, and I use bits for other horses, and different bits. And again, that sounds good in theory, but it's still missing the point. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So if it's not about bits versus bitless, it's not about the tools, and it's not about the hands that use it, and it's not about doing what's best for the horse, what question do I think we should be talking about? Well, before we can answer that, let's take a step back and look at why are people using bits in the first place? Or for that matter, bitless bridles, but let's focus on bits. Why are people using them? What are they trying to do with them? So the communication thing that most people will claim is the reason that they're using a bit. They're not using it for control. They're not using it to correct the horse. They're not using it to inflict any pain on the horse. They're just using it for subtle communication. I really want us all, as, a, as an equestrian community, to look really, really hard at whether that's actually true. Everyone knows you don't ride the horse from the head. You don't ride the horse with the reins. You ride the horse back to front. Uh, everyone will say you don't shape the head with the reins. You don't put the horse into a frame using his head. The head goes where it goes as a natural side effect of what's happening in the rest of the horse's body. Again, this is what everyone says, but is this what everyone does? But there's this huge gap between what we all know we should do and that everyone is supposed to do and what people actually do. People will use the metaphor of, but a bit is not, is not in any way um, cruel or abusive or painful to the horse because if you're using it correctly, it's just like holding hands. And I really want us to look at that too. First of all, is that even true? Is that a good metaphor, holding hands versus we've got something in the horse's mouth? There's so much talk about self-carriage, but I think most of us know that the majority of, well, sport horses or horses, horses of, of any type, including Icelandic sport horses in Tolt, are so often held by the rider's hands, usually using a bit. So that, of course, is not self-carriage. And that was the question that I finally had to face because I knew that the words coming out of my mouth when I would be just justifying why I was doing what I was doing didn't actually fit what I was doing. Meanwhile, it's the horses that were paying the price. 
And I don't think it's anyone's fault because this is how we all grew up. We're surrounded by an equestrian culture where bits are the norm, where everyone just rides with a bit or you're kind of the unusual one or worse. But again, I want you to think long and hard. If you, were, if you were born and raised in a culture where you never saw a horse with something in his mouth used to control him and bend him and correct him, even gently, how would it look if you saw that for the first time? The argument, I think, about bits versus bitless often comes down to which one uh, causes more pain. At least this is the argument that people typically have. So people on the bit side will say, well, wait a minute. The horse's face is extremely sensitive, and there are all these nerves. And if you're putting all that pressure on the horse's face, and then you have, for example, the mechanical hackamore, which I think is really a terrible piece of equipment, um, and one that the horse can't really escape from, so when I think of bitless versus bits, I never think of a mechanical hackamore. And uh, I, I don't think there's any argument to be made for why that would be better than a bit. But I think when most of us, not all, but when most of us are talking about bitless bridles, we're talking about something that makes it much harder to accidentally inflict pain and damage on the horse. So a big, flat, wide side pull. Now, I've asked a lot of people why they don't use them who have actually tried them. And often they'll say, well, because the horse just ignored it. So that right there tells us something <laughs> about either the quality of the rest of our cues to the horse or it tells us that the horse is able to ignore it, the big, wide, soft side pull, because it doesn't actually hurt. Um, the pressure is so much lighter that the horse isn't trying to get away from the pressure. But to be really clear, no matter how much we think we know about bits, the science of what's actually happening in the mouth how it's actually impacting the horse, there's very little that's been studied about what actually is happening inside the horse. In fact, those studies are only just barely beginning to happen. And as far as I can tell, we don't really have any science, or certainly no science that's robust in any way that says bits don't hurt a horse, bits are fine. Now, there's not a lot of, uh, I think, credible studies that show bits are a problem, but there are some. And so this is what I want to talk about. Bits appear to cause mouth lesions, no matter how good a job we've done at using the bit and even fitting the bit. A, a lot of studies have said as a conclusion, well, we just need to be better at getting the correct fit. But if it's that hard to fit, that even professional and expert riders are still showing up with horses who actually do have lesions in the mouth, uh, then I think we can say that in practice, 
if it's so hard to get the correct fit, it's the same to me as saying it's maybe not possible. Have you ever had a sore in your mouth? Think about how much that hurts. And remember, horses have all the same neural architecture of pain that humans do. There's still endless debates among experts on even which snaffle bits are kinder than others, uh, depending on the type of snaffle, right? So if you look at, again, you question 100 equestrian experts, including the biomechanics experts, on bits, you will still get 100 potentially different responses. What's always been disturbing to me is that they start from the premise of, but we're going to use a bit. So these studies that come out on, on mouth lesions and bits, uh, they're not usually reported as, oh shit, there's a problem with bits. It's, we need to get better at how we use them. And again, I look at, at as if there are that many experts and professionals who are not able to avoid those mouth lesions, then I think we do have to look at the gear. That it isn't just a question of the hands that use it. It's the very nature of there's something inside the horse's mouth. Now let's get to the question I really do care about. This is the question that I wish we were discussing instead of what's better, bits are bitless, what's kinder, bits are bitless, what should we be using, who should be using them. And that question is, why are we putting so much pressure on the horse's head? <laughs> Whether it's the mouth or something in the face. And first of all, there will also be arguments that, well, the nose is actually more sensitive than the mouth, right? We absolutely do not know that. We cannot say that. It's the nociceptors. It's the little teeny tiny individual neurons um, detecting potential damage and also just the mechanoreceptors that are detecting any pressure at all. And the mouth and the face are full of them. We know the mouth is sensitive. It has to be sensitive to be a functioning mammal. Uh, and of course, we know the face is sensitive just as this is true for humans. So there are so many mechanoreceptors and nociceptors in the head, including, of course, the mouth, that it's really, I think, pointless to argue over which one might hurt more. Because depending on the equipment, you could certainly hurt a horse with a lot of bitless bridles. It is very difficult to inflict pain on a horse with a very gentle, soft side pull, which is exactly why I use it, because there's no way I can ever, no matter what I do, I'm never going to be able to stop my horse from occasionally moving his head faster than I can actually go with him. So I use the biggest, softest, usually, side pull that I can find. Does that mean that I don't have a lot of precise communication through that big, wide, soft noseband, of course. But again, in theory, I shouldn't be riding from my hands and reins anyway. Which, by the way, I think when a lot of people switch from bitless or from bits to bitless, <laughs> boy, do you find out really quickly that you were riding from your hands way more than you thought you were. So the real question is, why are we putting all that pressure on the horse's head? Because again, what we know about training and riding, even just from the classical traditional perspective, right now I'm coming from really modern movement science. But let's put that aside, because just coming from a traditional and classical background, we still all know we should not be riding front to back, that we should be riding back to front, that we shouldn't be riding with all that pressure in the horse's face, that it should just be like the metaphor, we're just holding hands, right? But that's not what I see.
we're trying to shape the horse's movements. So chances are that means we're driving the horse into the restriction of the, the restraints from the reins. So we're driving him into the pressure on his face in an attempt to get, I, I don't know. Um, typically, we're trying to get the horse, quote unquote, balanced. But as you know, there is no world in which balance is something that is achieved from external pressure. Because <laughs> that's not balance. Balance, by definition, has to be instant, automatic, reflexive, self-organized. If your balance is dependent on someone putting you into a position, you know, and you're up on the high wire, right, you're dead. So uh, this is not any definition of balance. Um, picture someone on a balance beam, right? They might have a spotter there so that if they start to fall off the beam, someone can stop them from being injured. But that's very different from someone putting them into the position. And if you have ever been a gymnast, as I once was long ago, you'll know that one of the scariest things that you can experience is when someone attempts to restrict part of your body while you're doing something that's potentially scary and requires a lot of balance. Um, anyway, another story for another time. So putting all that pressure on the horse's head um, is certainly not helping the movement. It's at best a, a, a crutch, something to compensate for the fact that the horse doesn't actually have self-carriage. But if we solve the self-carriage problem without pressure on the face, then all of the discussion about bits versus bitless pretty much is pointless. Because if your horse is carrying himself before you ever use a bit or something like a harsh bitless bridle, anything that really truly can inflict some pretty intense discomfort on the horse's head, but if the horse is carrying himself, then it doesn't really matter, right? Like in theory, if your horse is able to carry a bit, but you're not really using it. I mean, you can imagine, right? If you just throw the reins away and ride the horse and the horse has self-carriage, that bit's not gonna cause a lot of problems. I mean, it, it, there's still issues about something in the horse's mouth, but uh, I think that for the most part, I would be okay, for example, and have been okay with a uh, Dramer for example, was ridden in a dressage show by, by a dressage rider, not by me. But he has so much self-carriage, even though he's not built for it, but he's, he's learned to organize himself that she, of course, had to ride him in a bit because it is a requirement, sadly, for most dressage competitions. But it was no problem at all for him. He can have a bit in his mouth because this rider, who was very skillful, she wasn't relying on the bit to shape him into the movements at all. So it was no big deal. And I think that's my own personal philosophy about when it's appropriate to use a bit, not for training, not because we need it, but when it's no big deal. But that means first getting there without all that pressure on the face. And most training doesn't really do that. <laughs> but as we know, it's certainly very, very possible and not that difficult to actually uh, help the horse develop self-carriage without putting pressure on the face. And again, when I say self-carriage, I mean true uh, being able to shift the weight to the hind, especially if he's carrying a rider, lift the base of the cervical spine, not be falling forward onto the forehand, but be in an agile position and posture so that no one has to hold him into place. No one has to drive him and then restrain him to get that movement. He's able to be up himself. Uh, so that's the question I wish that we were having. And I have put that question to the Icelandic, some of my Icelandic 
uh, community friends quite a lot because you do see a huge amount of pressure on the horse's head in told. But you often don't see that same kind of rein pressure being used by riders for almost any other gait. <laughs> so this has never made any sense. <laughs> so my personal feeling is we should only ever ride, ever on the horse's back, we should only ever ride what the horse already owns as a movement that he can do without having to rely on us to hold him into the position. Because if we're holding him, he doesn't own it, which means his nervous system is compensating and all the things, right, that movement science is now telling us, um, but hasn't seemed to have infiltrated the equestrian world. Um, but I wish that it would. Um, because if you have ever ridden a horse that does have uh, his own self-carriage and owns his movements. And you may be able to influence him and may be able to dance with him depending on how well-trained he is with cues and how subtle you are. But the feeling is so glorious because you're not ever having to squeeze or muscle or... I mean, you truly are doing what everybody seems to want to do and claim to do, which is dance with the horse. But it's impossible to dance with a partner when you are not just holding their hand and you're not just simply leading, but you're muscling them into positions or at least holding on with all that you've got when they're trying to resist. Uh, so that's the debate that I wish we were having. Nothing that can, in movement science, that suggests in any way, I mean, a horse is a mammal, that some things can only be achieved with a bit. That doesn't make logical sense. And I'm prepared to argue that with anyone. Now, most of the time, when I've heard people say, yeah, but that's how you get jaw flexions, well, the question to ask is, <laughs> Why was the jaw tight in the first place, right? That usually we're trying to use a bit to correct something that was originally caused by the bit. So if, if the bits are not being used, we lose the potential for a whole bunch of problems. But again, it doesn't mean that bits can't be used. And I think that for certain kinds of aesthetics, um, or because you really are so advanced, so advanced, so expert, that you really do have that sort of magical ability to communicate in the subtle way. And for the life of me, I don't know why, but can't figure out any other way to do it without that attachment to the mouth in some way, then I don't think it has to be a problem. The horse can carry it, right? I'd still prefer that nobody did that, but I don't think it's a big deal. And I wouldn't think it was a big deal if my horses now were asked to carry a bit. Because so what, <laughs> right? They, they don't need it. The movements that they do with or without a rider in no way depend on being held in the front. So once you stop training through restraint and you get the back to front, you get the elevation through, you know, tasks and environments that don't have anything to do with that. And the horse develops his own self-carriage without that. So uh, that's my opinion. I think that the science absolutely supports this. But, um, you know, I could be completely wrong. And everyone has to do what they think is best. I just like for people to know that there are options. Keep in mind also, I am not a horse professional and I am not an expert in uh, riding. <laughs> um, but I know a hell of a lot about movement science because that is my background. So, thanks for listening.